So now let's talk about the causes of heart failure. In other words, what makes the heart fail then? Well, the heart is a pump. And if the pump wears out, that would be an important cause of congestive cardiac failure. And the most important cause, the most common cause, is the disease of the heart muscle, the engine cause. And the most important cause of muscle disease is the disease of the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries become occluded with plaque and atherosclerosis. The muscle becomes fibrotic and in time it fails. So muscle disease of any kind would be an important cause of congestive cardiac failure. The second cause of left ventricular failure is some sort of valve disease. Either the valves become narrow or stenotic or they become incompetent. Either way, the left ventricle has to work harder and harder and in time it will fail. And the third main cause of left ventricular failure is systemic hypertension. The blood pressure is unduly raised and the left ventricle has to work harder and harder to pump that blood against an increased peripheral resistance and it will fail. So within these three, we have the major causes of left heart failure. Muscle disease, valve disease, and systemic hypertension. And I've already told you that right heart failure can occur on its own, but comparatively rare, and those things are like chronic lung disease, where the right ventricle has to work harder and harder to pump that blood against the diseased pulmonary circulation and it will fail. Or disease of the thoracic chest wall, kyphoscoliosis, the bending of the spine, where the right ventricle has to work harder to pump blood against an abnormal pulmonary circulation, and it will fail. And the third main cause of right ventricular failure is a pulmonary emboli, an infarct. So within these six causes, we have the major causes of heart failure. Muscle disease, valve disease, systemic hypertension on the left, chronic lung disease, disease of the thoracic chest wall, and a pulmonary emboli on the right. Now, other than these six causes, doctors recognize some important accessory risk factor. And the most important accessory risk factor is age. I mean, your heart can't go on pumping forever. It may pump till you're 86 and fail because the myocardium is ancient. I mean, there may be a degree of underlying coronary artery disease, but age is a very important accessory risk factor. Anemia is another important accessory risk factor. That is, if the myocardium is not getting enough oxygen herself and has to work harder to pump oxygenated blood to the various tissues, it may tip it into heart failure, particularly so if you have any of the other causes. So age is an important accessory risk factor, anemia is an important accessory risk factor, and if you have an overactive thyroid driving your heart at a faster rate, that too would become an accessory risk factor. So thyrotoxicosis of any cause would be an important accessory risk factor. Now before I leave you the causes, I should perhaps mention to you a condition called cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy is another name for muscle disease. I have already told you that coronary artery disease causes muscle disease. But there are a large number of other conditions which tend to do the same. In some cases, the myocardium is inflamed because of a viral infection. In some cases, the myocardium is infiltrated with abnormal material. In some cases, we know certain drugs poison the cardiac muscle. These are all lumped together and called cardiomyopathy. So if someone who is young with a normal blood pressure, no valve disease, no chronic lung disease and no underlying coronary artery disease goes into cardiac failure, 
it would make the likelihood of a cardiomyopathy extremely likely. So we've talked about the causes. Let's talk a little bit about the symptoms of heart failure. A posh word for shortness of breath is dyspnea, difficulty with breathing. So we talk about dyspnea as being the principal or the major symptom of patients with heart failure. And from what I've said to you already, you probably realize that it is most common when the left heart fails. May I go over this again? The left ventricle fails to empty, the left auricle becomes congested, the pulmonary veins become congested, the pulmonary capillaries become congested, the pressure within them rises, and edema and fluid will exude into the alveoli. Our patient's lungs are going to become waterlogged. They cannot oxygenate their blood, therefore, and become desperately dyspneic, desperately short of breath. Another feature is edema. Tissue fluid, fluid around the cells in the various tissues. And that is most likely to occur in the dependent parts. So if you're walking around, that means around your ankles. If you're lying in bed, that means around your lumbosacral region. So you wouldn't expect patients who are lying in bed to show much ankle edema because they're likely to have it in the dependent parts. And the most dependent part in bed is the lumbosacral region. Fluid can also occur in the body cavities, so that the chest can fill up. A pleural fusion, fluid in the pleural cavities, outside the lung, next to the chest, that can occur in patients with heart failure. The abdomen can swell because of the retained fluid, that is called ascites, A-S-C-I-T-E-S, and also the liver can become congested. I'll come back to that in a minute. So that patients complain of shortness of breath, swelling of the ankles, and by the time they're seen at the consultant, by the consultant there may be fluid in the body cavities. Also very rarely you get fluid in the pericardial cavities, but very rarely. Another symptom of patients with heart failure is that they complain of right abdominal pain. That is because the liver is congested, is tense, is stretched as capsule, and instead of being tucked underneath the coastal margin, it's way up here. Why is the liver congested? Because the right ventricle fails to empty, the right auricle becomes congested, and we're going to have congestion of the organs like the liver, which drain on the right side. And that is why they have congestion of the liver, a painful liver. So now let's talk a little bit about this shortness of breath. It's called effort dyspnea because it comes about when patients do things. Doctors called it effort dyspnea and they grade it from one to four. So they talk about effort dyspnea, grade one, grade two, and grade three, and they give patients various tasks. Can you walk five yards or so? Can you go up and down the stairs? Can you do so and so and so and so and so and so? So the next time they can see you, they'll know whether you're more to sneak or whether you've made progress. Another thing which happens with patients with that have left ventricular failure, congestive heart failure, is that they complain of shortness of breath, not when they're walking, not when they're going up and down the stairs, but at night. So it wakes them out of their slumber. Then that is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. It's called paroxysmal because it occurs in attacks, nocturnal because it happens at night time, and dyspnea because that's what it is, shortness of breath. I mean, patients will not come up and say to you, last night I had paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. But they will come up and say, my wife made me a lovely meal last night and I was doing perfectly well for myself. I went up down, down the stairs, I took my clothes off, I was perhaps just a little bit short of breath taking my clothes off. And I went to bed, I read my book and I fell asleep. And I woke up at 3 a.m. desperately short of breath, gasping for air. I had to sit up, it was very unpleasant, very uncomfortable. 
and sometimes that is called cardiac asthma or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And there are various reasons for this. I need not bother telling you all about this. I'll suffice it to say that if you lie someone flat in bed, you compromise the failing heart further. And that's what normally people do when they go to bed. They lie flat in bed. And when you lie someone flat in bed, you increase the inflow of blood to the right side and you decrease the pulmonary venous drainage on the left. And the lungs become squeezed in the middle. And you end up with cardiac asthma or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Perhaps I should talk to you a little bit about the causes of the edema because you are correctly saying to yourself that there is a rise in the venous pressure that is transmitted to the capillaries and edema and fluid is going to exude between the cells like Starling said it would, Starling's law. But it's not quite simple as that. And the main reason why patients with heart failure develop edema is because there is renal abnormality. The circulation to the kidneys is impaired and the kidneys scream and shout and make an order for goodness sake we are suffering here, retain fluid. And they secrete aldosterone by the bucketful. Aldosterone which is a potent sodium and hence a water retaining hormone. They overdo the job, they overcompensate and you end up with edema on top of what Starling said it would, Starling's law. Patients may not necessarily notice the edema, but they will notice the end results. So if you were to ask them, Mrs. Smith, are you passing less urine? The answer will come back as, yes, I'm passing less water. They are passing less water because they are retaining it in the various tissues. So they have polyuria. And another thing which happens, with patients with heart failure, an interesting thing that happens is that there is a no reversal of the normal rhythm which makes you pass more water at daytime than at nighttime. In patients with heart failure, the opposite occurs. So they have nocturia. 